Saxon Advanced Mathematics Lesson 41. I just got a really fun good news, bad news situation. I finished working this example, made a really dumb mistake in it, and had to take a minute to figure out what I did wrong. Eventually got it back on track, explained to you what I did wrong, uh, apologized for my ridiculous mistake, blah, blah, blah finished, went on to do the next problem, then I looked up. I have to kind of stand up to see, to check on my phone. I can't see the display as I'm recording my lesson. And it had stopped. My phone was full. I had to delete some stuff. Um, but in any case, you missed the whole drama. So now I get to do the problem over again, which is kind of a pain, but I won't make the same mistake. It'll be much better. So I'm very happy. All right. Here's this problem, ready? Secant of 10 pi over three. Okay, so we have radians drama, we'll have to fix that. Plus cosecant of minus seven pi over two. And we put parentheses around, remember we call this the argument, because we want to keep that minus sign in a bundle with that. So we put the parentheses around it to hold it that way. Okay, and then we need all of our information. We need we know, need to know that pi equals 180. Pi over three, we know is 60. And pi over two is equal to 90. That's gonna help us simplify those. Then we'll need our trig functions, or our reciprocals anyway. Cosecant, secant, cotangent. And remember, they're just the other guys upside down. Ho ha ao. I don't know. That just sticks in my head. If somebody can come up with a sentence about Oscar and Arthur and continue their fight drama, I'd love to know it. And then we're going to need to know the positive negative signs of the functions in the different quadrants. Remember that these guys have the same signs as their parent functions. So we don't have to learn a new set of signs. Okay, let's fix these arguments and get them into degrees, shall we? Okay, pi over three is 60. Secant of 600, that number is larger than 360, but it's smaller than 720. So we'll subtract out 360, and that will give us the secant of 240. Okay, so I start imagining and counting off my quadrants going by 90s. 90, 180, okay, so it's gonna be in the third quadrant, because there's 90, there's 180. Now I need 60 more. So my triangle's gonna be kind of like that. I always struggle to draw these well. Um, this is the 60 degrees. This is the one, this is the two, this is the square root of three. Secant equals ha, right? So the secant of 240 will be the hypotenuse, which is square root of three over the adjacent. No, what am I saying? It's not square root of three. This is the hypotenuse. It's two over the adjacent, which is one. And secant goes with cosine in the third quarter. Cosine is negative. So this is a minus two over one for the secant of 10 pi over three. Woo, crazy, right? All right, so that's good. We're all the way down to here. Now we're gonna add to it whatever we get on this side. So this, we know, goes down to 90. I figured that out ahead of time. That's a two. Um, so this is gonna be the cosecant of minus 630. Okay, um, that's larger than 360, so I can subtract 360 from this. Minus 270. Okay, so now we're counting backwards. Now look what happens. We'll need 90, 180, 270. We're gonna end up Right, 90, 180, then we need all of this quadrant and our angle 
is going to be like that, isn't it? It's going to be at 270. It's a quadrantal angle, you might even say. So what we need is our quadrangle angle chart, angle chart. And this is where I went awry before <clears throat> because I got all confused. This is a minus 270 degree angle, but it's also a 90 degree angle, right? So no wonder I went a little nutty on this because I was counting it wrong. So this is, it's cosecant, so that means it is going to be the same as the sine at 90 degrees. And I made a mistake in my chart. The sine of 90 degrees is one. Okay, that's on our quadrantal chart. And we can see it here because the hypotenuse is almost, because if we measure this as being one, the hypotenuse is one and the opposite side is one. The adjacent side is just a little bitty bit. That's like zero. Um, so we can write this as one over one if we'd like. And then when we write it to get the cosecant of 90 degrees, that will also be one over one, right? Because we flipped it. With quadrantal angles, they come with their sign already attached. So we don't have to worry about this. And so we know that it's minus two over one plus one over one, right? Because that's what we've got right here. And so our final answer is minus two plus one equals minus one. That's the right answer. Yay. All right. That's kind of crazy. So we can mix quadrantal angles in. We've So we're using reciprocals, we're using radians, we're using quadrantals. We got all cra kinds of craziness going on. Okay, and then we have one more of these to do. Make sure my phone's still going. As you can imagine, my camera roll quickly fills with lessons. And so I have to keep deleting them obviously, so I can keep recording more, even though I have uh, cloud storage. I have other things on my phone too, you guys. I don't just teach math all the time. I mean, yeah, it's my favorite times, but I gotta have videos of my dogs and my cats too, right? Um, so anyway, it overflowed and that's what happened last time. So I had then to like, you know, make some tough choices about which games I was gonna delete. Whew, agonizing. Okay. Draw appropriate triangles and evaluate. So same instructions. Cotangent of 17 pi over six. I remind myself that pi over six equals 30. I'm gonna just lead with that. Minus the square root of six times the cosecant of minus nine pi over four. Four. Again, the parentheses are here to hold the minus sign close to the argument. Pi over 4 equals 45 degrees. Let's get our reciprocals down again. Cosecant, secant, cotangent, ho, ha, ayo. All right, and then our positive negative signs. Hope you've got all this memorized. Beautiful. Okay, let's fix our arguments. Let's translate them from radians into degrees because life is so much better that way. 30, 17 times 30, huh? Well, that sounds like a side calculation if ever there was 17 times 30. You can just let the zero kind of hang off the edge, 21. 510. Okay, let's take 360 from that, and we will have the cotangent of 150 degrees. All right, let's draw a picture. We're gonna need 90, and then we're gonna need 60 more. We need all these 90, we need 60 more, so that means we'll only have 30 left. 
but that's okay because I like a 30 degree triangle. This is the two, this is the one, this is the square root of three. Cotangent equals AO, which in this case is the adjacent square root of three over the opposite, which is one. It's gonna have the same plus minus value as tangent in the second quadrant. Tangent in the second quadrant is negative, so that means this is also negative, okay? That is a lot to remember. Look, radians to degrees, take out the extra spin, graph it, find the right function, get its values, write them as a fraction, then check the positive negative sign. I'm telling you, this is not for chimps. Now we get to do it all over again, right? Now there's a minus sign in our problem. And those can be tricky. I'm gonna right away put that down here and I'll draw this arrow so that I'm clear on where the heck that came from. Because sometimes you'll have a minus sign sitting there and be like, wait, what? Get out of here. All right, let's fix this. Pi over four is 45 degrees. 45 times nine, well, this is a head trip because that's um, 45 again, right? Four times nine is 36 plus four is 40. So this becomes square root of six times the cosecant of minus 405. Now that's got an extra spin in it, so let's take 360 away. So we'll have square root of six times the cosecant. Remember, we always multiply by our coefficient. We just wait till the end. That's just leave it alone. He's drama. Then this is gonna be what, minus 45 degrees. Unless I miss my guess there, right? Okay. Minus 45 degrees, that sounds like fourth quadrant to me. Right, because it means we just go halfway and we're done. So this is one, one, square root of two. You wouldn't think so, I didn't draw that very evenly, but whatever. Okay, cosecant is ha, no, it's ho, which equals hypotenuse, square root of two over opposite one. Cosecant goes with sine, we're in the fourth quarter, sine is negative in the fourth quarter. So that means I am subtracting that. But I still have to multiply this. So it's gonna be, let me bring this down. It's minus square root of three over one minus square root of six over one times minus square root of two over one. Oh my glory, that's a lot, isn't it? Okay, let's distribute. So this becomes minus, and I'm gonna drop these fractions out. We don't seem to need them. Minus square root of three plus, those two go together to make a plus. Now, this is gonna be six times two is 12, but I know that breaks out into two times two times three. So I can pull out a pair of twos. Two on the inside is one on the outside. Square root of three, right? So when I multiply this and simplify, I get two square root of three. And I'm adding that to this. Now the radicals match, so I'm good. I'm gonna give him a wolf. Because not having one there makes it seem confusing. Now I can just go, oh, minus one plus two equals one square root of three, and I'll just write that. So my answer looks sophisticated and accomplished. <sighs> wow. Such a lot of drama. You probably don't write as big as I do, but that is a very serious problem, you guys. And I hope that when you do this, you go, wow, I am, I'm Albert Einstein in a postmodern world. That's what I am. I hope you feel really, really proud of yourself because these problems are hard and you have to have so much to make this happen in your brain.
So feel smart and let's go on and do something else that'll make you feel smart. Permutations. Now permutations, most students think are semi fun. They're word problems, but they're not too overwhelming. They're kind of fun because there aren't a lot of formulas you have to fuss about. You're just logic out each problem. And that's kind of nice. And that's what we're gonna do for the first part of this problem is we're just gonna logic it out. Then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you that if we want heavy um, emphasis on the if, we can, use, we can develop a formula for these problems and we can use a formula. Now John intentionally kept that knowledge to himself for a while so that you could just enjoy the innocent fun of playing permutations with your friends on a warm summer night. But now he's gonna torture you with a formula, but not yet. Let's do example 41.5. How many permutations, permutations just means arrangements, are there of 22 things taken six at a time. So I'm just gonna jot that down. 22 things taken six at a time. Generalize this answer for an expression. Okay, one thing at a time, John, one thing at a time. Now, because he says there are things, we assume that there's physical things and There's no replacement. And the best example, the best visual picture I can give you for this is that one time I was teaching a student when her family was getting ready to move. Natalie Smith. Her family was getting ready to move and we used to work in her dining room. And there along the wall where I could see it was a huge china cupboard full of all kinds of different bowls and gravy boats and serving bowls and baskets and you name it, all the stuff that moms jam into um, china cabinets was jabbed, but they were getting ready to move. So her mom was going through this with a fine tooth comb and giving away a ton of stuff. So there was stuff sitting all over the place. And there was also a windowsill in the room. And I said to her, with a problem almost exactly like this, what if we took masking tape and we divided along your windowsill six different boxes. And then we took 22 of the things out of your mom's china cabinet, ignored all the rest, but we took our 22 things and we put one of them into the first place. Just because we're working with limited physical objects, we would not be able to choose 21. Logic dictates, well, if we put one upon the windowsill, then we'd need to choose from just 21 more and then 20, et cetera, et cetera. So these problems, when we talk about physical items, we can assume there's no replacement for those. Okay, so let's draw the boxes. This is a map of the Smith's windowsill. If you are a student who found me on YouTube, and doesn't know many of my students are all friends. They all know each other, they go to the same church, their parents know each other, um, something like that. There, a lot of them are homeschooled and so they have grown up with um, hanging out with other families and spending a lot of time with them. And without any sort of plan, it's just worked out that I have taught math to many of these families. They kind of pass me from one family to the next. And so it's really fun because I don't necessarily know ahead of time who all knows each other, but then I will get new students and start talking to them and it turns out, oh, you know all my old students. So it's kind of fun. It's like a family reunion, except I didn't know I was part of the family. Okay, so what are we gonna do? This is Natalie's windowsill. We've got our 22 items. Quick, her mom's gonna pack them if we don't work fast. So for the first blank, we can choose any one of the 22. Then we're down to 21 and then 20, 19, 18, and 17. And that's where we stop, right? Because we only have six places on our window. So, so then we multiply these six numbers together and we get a really big number. I'll just show you the number. 
53,721,360 different ways that just those 22 items could be arranged on the windowsill. Whoa, that's a lot of stuff. Now, what if we don't want to draw a picture like this and go about the very cumbersome way of laying out this problem? There is a formula for how we can do it. We let one variable, we'll call it n, and that represents the number of things. In our case, it's 22. R represents how many are taken. This one, it's the hardest to put the right words to, but when we say 22 things taken six at a time, it's 22 things taken six at a time. Okay, usually it's easy to understand this one. This one, the wording gets a little awkward, but it's just the other number. Now, what we do is we have a special notation that we use. We put a big P, that means permutations, and then we put N and R. Okay, so for our example, it would be 22 and six. And we would say, we're finding, we're calculating the number of permutations of 22 things taken six at a time. And we know that this is going to be, we know it has to work out to 21 times, or you see what I'm writing. So now we have to figure out a way to write this as a formula. Okay, 22 is the number of things, right? So we can let that, this be n, and then we're going to multiply it by n minus 1, and n minus 2, right? 21, 21 minus 1, 21 minus 2, dot, 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 until we get all the way down here. Now, this last term is going to make you go, what? But I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll explain it, rather. N minus R plus 1. Okay. This is the definition of the ending term. And here's how it makes sense. We need to have six terms described in letters down here, right? Because we're taking six at a time. So we start with the first one. That's equal to n. Then we subtract one, then we subtract another one, then we subtract another one. We keep on going, right? Because we just want one less each time we multiply another number. But how do we know when we're at the end? Well, we know that we need to take six of them at a time, right? So you would think that if we were subtracting six, that would be the right number. But this isn't. Six, 22 minus 17 equals five. Okay, so we don't want this last term to be n minus r because that would be too many, right? If we did 22, minus six, then that would take us all the way down to 16 and that's too many terms, right? We don't want to include 16 in the string. We want to stop here. So this is calculated to say, we'll start with our beginning number of things. We'll subtract out the number that we're taking, but we have to add one back. And the reason why is because our first number, we don't subtract any. If that makes any sense to you, great. If not, just trust me, this is the formula that we use for permutations. If you don't understand what I'm explaining, that's okay. Just use it. And I think, oh, Okay, so there's the formula. Now I just want to do one more problem, and this is getting into the theoretical. I would just sat here debating, do I really want to do this? Because for some students, it just makes their heads go wobbly. But I'm just going to hope that no one's head wobbles. Okay, so we just said, 
P things, you know, N things take an R at a time. We can get by multiplying N times N minus one times N minus two times as many more N minuses as we need until we get down to N minus R, but then we add one back because the first term doesn't have any subtraction in it. All right, so. What if we want to write this in a factorial form? We figured this out. I'll show you what I mean. John's kind of beating a dead horse. He's, he's trying to make it easier for you, but I think he's making it harder. So in our example, we said multiply 22 times 21 times 20 times 19 times 18 times 17, right? So there's six things. Now he's gonna give us another formula and let's see if this makes any sense. We're using factorials. Oh, this would be, no, this is right. Okay, so let's look at this in our example. It would be 22 factorial divided by n minus r, 22 minus six factorial. Okay. And then let's break this down a little bit more. 22 factorial over 22 minus six is 16 factorial. Now let's break this down. 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17. And then all of this is 16 factorial. I'm gonna stop writing them at 16 and just make the factorial. And then we divide it by 16 factorial. That cancels these two out, and it leaves our answer as just this, which is exactly what we want. So while we did develop a formula for finding permutations, this formula is large and cumbersome. This formula is short and sweet, and it works in calculators super easily, right? Because like with this problem, you just go, oh, 22 factorial divided by 22 minus six is 16, 16 factorial, and you will get the right answer. So this is the one that you really want to keep close to your trigger fingers for easy calculation. But honestly, the whole thing kind of makes me roll my eyes because for purposes of this class, you can really just logic it out the way we did in the first place right here. But I do want you to know that these formulas exist. This one's fine, it's just a little cumbersome. This one is much faster and easier to work with. You know what? I have said more than enough. Oh, here's one more. Ah, oh, can you imagine? Example, 41.7. Find the P of 12 items taken four at a time. All right, well, let's just use our thing. So it's 12 items taken n minus r, 12 minus four, eight at a time. You grab a calculator, you run it through, and you find out, well, let's, let me just show you. It'd be 12 times 11 times 10 times nine times eight factorial over eight factorial. These cancel. This is what we're left with, which is what we would have wanted in the first place, right? 12 items taken four at a time. There's the four boxes and there's the 12 items. And when we multiply it through, our answer is 11,880 different ways. So if Natalie's family moves again, we only need to put four spaces on their uh, windowsill. And you know, even if her mom has downsized the China collection, we're good. All right, so this was a good example that illustrates how quickly you can work these problems if you use this formula. 
Okay, I'm done talking. Um, we're back to regular homework. I'm sorry. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, and we're done with lesson 41. Thanks, bye.